Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast. Our topic today is Demystifying Vias in High-Speed PCB Design, sponsored by Keysight Technologies. I'm Bill Wong, Technology Editor with Penton's Design, Engineering, and Sourcing Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the yellow help icon below the slides. To maximize the slide presentation window, click on the small green button at the top right corner of the slide window. Please know that we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and then hit the submit button. Additionally, today's session is being recorded and will be emailed to you within the next week. You may also download a PDF copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon in the toolbar beneath the slides. Now let me introduce today's speaker. He Su Lee holds a BSEE degree from Hankook Aviation University, Korea. He has more than 20 years of design and experience in the area of RF and microwave design and is currently the application specialist for 3D EM solutions at Keysight EESOF EDA. Now let me turn things over to our presenter. He Su, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> and welcome, everyone, for joining this webcast. So let's talk about the, the, the what is VIA. Uh, VIA basically is an electrical connection between layers to pass a signal from one layer to the other. As you can imagine, single layer designs do not require any of VIAs. VIAs are only for multi-layer PCBs or packages to route signals. Why do we really care about VIAs? It's because of the discontinuity uh, that's generated uh, from the other signal transition, which significantly affect the other signal and power integrity in high-speed uh, designs. Catacity capacitance of VIA also possible increase a signal rise time, making the signal speed slower. Therefore, designers should maintain a good impedance transition for the design. So let's take a look. One of the example, <clears throat> what is the what is the effect? Uh, coming from the VIA transition for high-speed channels. The example structure that I'm using for this test is basically cascaded 3-inch microstrip transmission line plus a 3-inch strip line structures back-to-back. Uh, -back. So that means the total line length is about the other 6 inches. So putting a 10 gigabit per second data into this channel, the data what you are seeing, which is the I diagram coming from the channel, is shown in this picture. So we can see that the I height is about the 615 millivolts, and I width is about the 96 picosecond. What if we put a VS in between? between the 3-inch microstrip and 3-inch strip line, then we're going to see the quite different results. In this case, the eye height is about 567 millivolts, and the eye width is about, uh, it's a little bit blurry, but uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> which is about 89.5 picosecond. Therefore, we can see that uh, just inserting the VIA that really closed the eye uh, performance of the channel. When we are <coughs> putting that VIA structure in between, uh, as we just talked about, 
eye closure is noticeable, where at 10 giga, gigahertz, there is extra 3 dB loss, which is coming from the via structures. When we are removing the via stuff uh, from, from the via structure, then eye goes back to a pre-clean eye, uh, which is close to the original a performance we saw uh, from the eye diagram. So now we're back to uh, get AI by just removing the stuff. When we are increasing the data rate, which is close to the uh, the Nyquist a frequency of the the data rate, then uh, as you can see, the I data is completely closed. So in this case, what I'm trying to tell you is that we didn't change any of, channel, any of channels. Microstrip and strip lines are exactly the same. But by just insertion of VS structure, I performance of the channel is quite changing. Uh, this is why we are looking into the VS structure and try to understand the, the basics of VS and understanding the characteristics of the VIA as much as possible uh, through this presentation. So let's take a look uh, what types of VIA is available. Uh, by looking at the VIA structure uh, from the, the implementation standpoint, uh, we can see there is a PTH, which is plated through whole VIA, line VIA, buried VIA, micro VIA, Etc. Blind via, for example, is the via structure that is open to top or bottom layer, layer of the PCB, but the other end of the via is actually uh, you know, inside of the structure, the PCB structure. If you read via, uh, there is no way to access the either end of the via barrel. Therefore, it's completely embedded into the structure. But when we are looking at a VIA structure from a signaling standpoint, we can think of a single-ended VIA or a differential VIA, signal VIA, ground VIA, etc. So by looking at from the, the physical and the, uh, the signal <coughs> viewpoint, uh, we can see that uh, there are various different naming of the photo of VIA structures. Going into a little bit more detail on the VIA structure, uh, let's talk about the anatomy of VIA itself. So let's start with the VIA barrel, uh, which is the, the con conductive cube filling the drill hole, uh, which is basically the connection uh, between layers uh, through uh, this VIA barrel. We can also think about the, the VIA pads, uh, which is the, the, the connection uh, of each end of the via barrel uh, to the components, plane, or trace. What about the via anti-pads, or you know, sometimes we call it as via clearance? Is a hole between barrel and the metal layer to which it is not connected. So one other uh, important thing uh, we need to understand is non-functional uh, via pads. Due to uh, PCB reliability, several layers still have the other via pad, uh, which is the one we call a non-functional via pad, which is the one uh, internal or ex external pad that are not connected to any traces or components. One, one important thing when we are uh, trying to understand the, the characteristics of VIA is the return current path. These are typical characteristics of a uh, VIA return current path. As we all know, the return current must find a path to return to the source. At a higher frequencies, Return current will favor the path of least impedance. 
instead, you know, flowing the current into higher impedance, naturally uh, the return current will try to find the other least impedance so that it goes back to the other source uh, in an easier way. The other important thing is due to the skin effect, the current flow along the metal sur surface not penetrating through. So as we see uh, from this picture, uh, the return current is close to the metal strip. For example, top and bottom a microstrip a structure. The return current will be flowing through right underneath of the strip, not the other a side of the metal uh, plane. This is another important thing uh, we need to understand, how the, really, uh, the return current flow for a, this type of DPS structure. As we can imagine, the closer the, the ground via to the signal via, the smaller the inductance of via is. This is why we have to reduce the size of the loop. Therefore, we can have the, the smaller inductance uh, for the uh, via structure to maintain the good impedance for the design. So let's think about the electrical motors uh, uh, for vias. Technically, there is no simple via motor for a multi-gigabit signals or higher frequencies. We can easily imagine that what type of motors we need to use, lumped or disputed. As you can see uh, from the picture to the right, this is a field vector plot for microstrip to via to micro, microstrip A transition. As you can imagine, uh, the mode of propagation for microstrip will be TEM. When the energy enters to the via structure, uh, if the structure is well designed, then mode of propagation might be a TEM as well. But in between TEM to TEM, uh, we are going to see there's the electric field lines, which generate the parasitic capacitance, as well as the inductance. We see that by changing the direction of the current. So as we can see uh, from the picture of the vector a E field plot, we can imagine that the model for via structure is not that simple. One typical question we can think of is that whether the via inductive, capacitive, or something else. As an example, let's take a look on the other this a three pictures uh, which carries the other positive and negative currents. The leftmost a picture shows the other two rods that carries the other positive and negative current, like a twist of the two pair a, a wires. And the second one, instead of having the other, another wire for the ground return, it has the other plane for the ground return. The third one is ha having the other two a, the planes, top and bottom. As we talked about the, other, the return path, can we say the impedance of these three cases the same? The answer is it depends. It's because the return path affects the impedance characteristic of the via. So let's examine uh, this characteristic of the via a little bit more uh, with this example uh, from this picture. This is a test structure. Substrate thickness of this test structure is about 100 mil, and substrate material is, is FR4. It has here the six metal layers. The via barrel radius is about five mil, and but I didn't put that a, a via pad for uh, this structure for testing pur purpose. And then test it for a two cases, one A's, a different size of via anti-pads. And then second is putting the, uh, the uh, different number of the uh, ground vias. For example, two ground vias, only two ground vias, or eight ground vias, or six ground vias, something like it. 
the result of this test is shown in this picture. So there are a, basically five cases uh, shown in this, in, in this plot. The blue one is having only two ground bees, having the 100 mil uh, anti-pads. The green trays, same two ground bees, so with the 50 mil uh, anti-pad, which is half of the blue. The red one is half of the green uh, that has the 25 mil uh, via anti-pads. By putting a more ground vias, from two ground vias to eight ground vias with the same uh, anti-pad size, we can see that uh, the black trace uh, shows you a better match. But by reducing the, uh, the, the anti-pad from the 25 mil to 12.5 mil, we can see that the trace impedance is changing, which is shown in this plot as a pink one. So once again, by changing the other anti-pad and putting the other different number of the other ground vias, we can tell the impedance is changing. So the answer to that one, uh, based on the different configuration of the via, uh, the, the impedance of the via uh, will be basically uh, changing quite a lot. One other thing I'd like to just mention uh, before we getting into the a little bit more detail uh, is something around the TDR or looking at the impedance, uh, which is a Z function of the F. As we know, TDR plots the impedance versus time or a dis distance. But one thing uh, we have to remember when we are doing the using any of TDR is is the minimum resolution, or which is the kind of uh, smallest feature size we can uh, analyze it over the TDR data. This minimum resolution depends on the rise time of the step signal we're going to use, or uh, based on the other signal bandwidth, which is coming uh, either from the other measured data or any of the simulation results. So there is a simple formula uh, to calculate the minimum resolution. Uh, so with the 10 picosecond, a rise time of the step, with the, uh, the electric constant of 4, we can, we can easily calculate the minimum resolution of the structure will be a 0.75 millimeter or around the 30 mil. Therefore, it will be quite challenging for us to use the TDR for the VIA itself, since the feature size of the VIA is typically a very, very small. With the band limited data, what are you going to get uh, from the simulations or measured data? You know, once again, it would be pretty hard for us to use the TDR to analyze the VIA itself. When we are having the long transmission line with the VIAs, then yeah, that's where we typically use the TDR data, but with the, the just uh, this type of uh, analysis or characteristic understanding the characteristic of the VIA, that will be uh, a little bit challenging to use the TDR. Therefore, therefore, I chose the other, the other way of plotting the impedance, uh, which is uh, just looking at the uh, Z magnitude of Z that plus the other impedance uh, versus uh, frequency and then we'll show the other frequency dependent characteristic of the impedance quite well. So back to the, the result we talked about. Uh, <clears throat> based on the other different size of the anti-pad and uh, a number of, of, number of ground vias, uh, we saw the, other, the change in impedance uh, based on the other different uh, configuration. So larger, as a summary, uh, if the size of the anti-pad bigger, then uh, we, we can tell the loop size of the VIA structure uh, larger. Therefore, the inductance of the structure will be higher, which shows, which are shown uh, in this plot with the blue, green, and basically red traits. 
when we are de- decreasing the size of the anti uh we can also tell the capacitance, uh, which is basically the capacitance between the, the barrel uh, to the ground plane, also increased. When we are putting the more ground bees, uh, the inductance will be reduced. That's what this plot says. When we are having the larger loop, the impedance plot will be a pretty much a inductive, but by controlling the size of the anti pad as well as controlling the number of ground bees, we can actually have the have really well matched a uh, via structure, which is matched from the zero to forty gig. Uh, in this example, as close to the F50 ohm, not change the impedance almost, uh, you know, zero. But when we are making the anti pad size smaller, smaller, then it becomes even more of a capacitive. That's what the, this pink trace shows. The impedance of the VL looks a more capacitive. Another another way to view uh, VIAs is looking at the VIA as a coaxial transmission lines, which is similar to the picture shown in this uh, in this slide. We can think of A and B, which is the, the, the inner a, the radius of the center pin. Uh, B equal to the radius for a the shell, uh, which is the ground return. By putting the number uh, we used to characterize a the via structure, which had which was a five mil for A and twenty five mil for B, having the other four point six for the D electric constant. When we are using the other those formulas, uh, we can easily calculate the impedance equal to forty five ohms, which was pretty close. Not exactly the same, but pretty close to the F50 ohm we saw uh, from the case we analyzed. So another another way to design VIA is to design the VIA as similar to the coaxial transmission line. Therefore, we can manage the impedance of the VIA very very well. Let's take a moment to think about the via path, uh, which is another you know, important uh, <coughs> characteristic uh, we need to understand when we are designing VIAs. So one definitely uh, the question uh, we ask ourselves, you know, is VIA capacitive or inductive? VIA paths in general add a capacitive characteristic to the impedance. The larger the via path size is, the lower the VIA impedance is due to uh, the increased A capacitance. This is well a shown uh, in this uh, Z11 plot in this slide. Let's go back to the test case uh, we used. Now we have the VIA pads uh, inserted. With the 50 ohm structure, uh, we designed, which is shown as a black, no pads. But as soon as we are adding the via pad with the same A dimension, that has the same via barrel radius, as well as the same A via anti pad, we can easily see that the red trace, which was the one added to via pads on top and bottom layers. As we can see, at lower frequencies, probably up to 14 gigahertz, all of a sudden, the impedance shown as yet a more of a lower impedance, which is uh, capacitive uh, in nature. By putting the other more a via pads, uh, not only top and bottom, but let's put the other via pad to all six layers, uh, which is the result uh, from the other this green trace. The capacitance is a lot more. What if we are decreasing, uh, I'm sorry, what if we are increasing the size of the via pads? 
which will make it a via path closer to the ground plane. Uh, we can easily imagine that there will be a more capacitance, uh, which is shown in this uh, plot of the cyan trace. So if we are making the via, via path size larger, then we can imagine that uh, the capacitance of the via will be a much more shown uh, uh, from the results. So far, we have taken a look on the uh, via itself, which comes with the via barrel, via pads, and the anti-pads. But generally speaking, uh, vias are all only used to connect uh, between the transmission lines for routing. So in this case, we're going to use the uh, microstrip to via, via to microstrip a uh, the transmission line routing, which is shown in uh, this 3D a plot, the model. On the top layer, there is a microstrip, and in the middle, there is a via structure. At the bottom, there is another a microstrip. So the simulation of this complex structure, 24 layers, 100 mil thickness, a microstrip to via, via to microstrip a, uh, a transmission line routing. The result is shown in this plot as a blue trace. Another simulation I did is basically separating this stru structure into three sections. One is just trans the microstrip and via itself, and the other is basically another a microstrip, a transmission line. The full wave EM result, which is blue, is not the same as the cascaded impedance of three sections. There is a quite a difference between the two. So we cannot tell. Uh, we just you know, use a circuit motor or a uh, dividing the uh, different sections into different a simulation data and just combine. It may not work that well as we see uh, from this result. Why is that? Is because uh, the difference between these two is due to the dangling tail edge of the microstrip transmission line close to the via, which add the inductance to the impedance, uh, basically. So how much of inductance, how, how can we estimate the, uh, this transition impedance? The inductance value can be simply extracted by matching the impedance between full wave and the cascaded results with additional inductance, inductors. And the configuration is shown in this plot quite well to the right. So one section of the microstrip, and there is a via, but in between, uh, there is additional inductors inserted. By tuning the value of the inductance, we can easily match the results of this cascaded impedance to the full wave EM results quite well. At higher frequencies, yeah, there is uh, quite a difference, but this is, this is very, very understandable is because what we are using uh, for the, that dangling a microstrip structure is a simple inductor, which is not a really uh, full uh, motor that covers up to the higher frequencies anyway. So this inductance may be compensated by decreasing the via anti pads or increasing the size of the via pads. So basically, uh, in, uh, adding the more of capacitance to compensate that inductance. So by doing so, we did a, a smaller a via anti pads. You, you can see that. Uh, the impedance match performance uh, can be improved. So with the same design, which was red, 30.25 mil uh, via anti-pads, but by reducing the uh, via anti-pad from 30.25 to 24.75, 20 uh, which is the black trace, and we can see the impedance got matched better. But still, the impedance variation is complex behavior. 
as I mentioned uh, from the other previous slide, it's not a simple LC, but there is a lot more parasitics uh, involved with the VS structure. Therefore, it may not be that easy to match throughout the entire A bandwidth, but there is a possibility by tweaking the all different dimensions. By simply changing the other via anti pads, uh, we can we can provide you a, a lot better a match performance up to 10 gigahertz, as shown in this in this results. Let's take a look on the via stuff, uh, which is important aspects of via design. The dangling portion of the via. And, and high-speed APCV designs acts as an open stub resonator, which is really a similar to the series LC resonator. As you know, at a quarter wavelength, starting from the open stub, the impedance be, uh, turns into a short impedance because of the quarter wavelength. Therefore, at that frequency, the insertion loss becomes the maximum, uh, which is shown uh, really, really well in the measure data uh, in this slide. The stub resonance suck out all the energy around the other 10 gigahertz uh, from this measure data. Uh, we can easily see that this is due to the, the, the via stub. The loss characteristic, not only at the stub resonant frequency, depends on the Q value of the stub. If the lower the Q of the design, the higher loss uh, we will see for larger a bandwidth. Another way to look at it is via stub is from the other wave standpoint. If the wave start from the other top edge of the VS stuff, travel through and coming back to the same point, then will be 180 degree out of phase. This will be canceling incoming signal since the phase difference between the two is 180 degree. That's why the loss at that frequency becomes the maximum, right? So let's take a look how the, the stuff resonant frequency changes. The main factor to change the stuff resonant frequency is the length of the stuff. So by changing the, the length of the stuff, and looking at a, the insertion loss, or DBS21, we can see that that a uh, the maximum deep, the frequency point is moving. With a around 93 mil length of the st stuff, the resonant frequency is about you know, 15 gigahertz. But making it shorter and shorter, uh, uh, we can see that the resonant frequency is moving up to higher and higher uh, frequencies. So by making the stub length shorter, uh, another way, moving the strip, down, strip layer down, the stub resonance frequency can be uh, pushed up to a higher uh, frequency. So how can we estimate it as via stuff? There are a multiple ways. One is just running the four-way VM, or use the, the, the first order approximation formula, which is shown in this, in this slide. So putting the 93 mil, uh, the length, we can get the 14.79 gigahertz, which is pretty close to four-way VM results. Or simply using the ADSA open stuff transmission line model, as shown in this uh, slide, by putting the, the same number 93, 
uh, we basically get you know, 14.948 gigahertz, which is almost close to the you know, 15 gigahertz uh, from the you know, full-wave VM. So before we design the DNA of uh, PCB, just looking at the other length of the VIA, putting into the length of the VIA into the other simple ADS model, uh, you can easily imagine what would be the uh, the, the sub resonance, uh, whether it may affect uh, my design or not. And the shape of the uh, the S21 uh, between the ADS model to full wave, uh, which is very, very close to each other. So, yeah, we can run the full-wave EM, which is uh, time-consuming, but we can use the simple uh, this simple ADS model to estimate the stuff resonant frequency. How, how can we uh, remove the, this stuff resonance? Uh, one simple way is to use the bacterial link. This via stuff resonance can be removed uh, or at least pushed up to a higher frequency by this back, back drilling. So here is an example. The stuff resonance frequency at 15 gigahertz with the case we just looked at. Uh, that resonance frequency can be completely removed by the back drilling. Right? So now we have a very flat, flat AEI insertion loss for the channel, not having the, uh, much of a problem uh, with the design anymore. So let's take a look on a this VS stuff uh, from the electric and magnetic A field uh, viewpoints. So as you know, uh, this is a side view of that 24 layer microstrip to be uh, to strip a structure. And the top two are the, the field data at 16.3 gigahertz uh, electric fields, and the bottom two show the other magnetic fields. So the stuff is basically having the old energy and not allowing the, the much of energy going to the strip at this frequency. Uh, which is the uh, stub resonant frequency, as we talked about, uh, is well displayed throughout the uh, electric and magnetic A field plot. So most of the energy will be confined within the stub, not a pushing the energy uh, back to the uh, strip, which makes it uh, the you know better a uh, transmission. But with that stub, yeah, there is no way. What about the other differential via? Uh, the differential via basically used for the other differential signaling by having the other two single-ended vias. The minimum via patch, uh, I'm sorry, there is a typo, uh, not patch, but pitch. The minimum via pitch size is determined uh, by the manufacturing specification because it used the other three hole so how close you can drill will uh, determine the minimum a uh, via pitch. Since these two via barrels are close to each other, as well as the other via uh, pads, there will be coupling. Coupling means overlap of electric and magnetic A field lines. This definitely changes the other differential impedance, which is uh, two times of Z0, you uh, know, minus a, the variation of the other impedance. You can imagine that uh, if I'm, you know, having the other one positive current and the other negative current, uh, the magnetic field will uh, affect the other, the, uh, each lines. But by having the other, the different direct, the dif different direction, uh, it re really uh, try to reduce the, uh, the the current value, which is making the impedance lower. The interaction is important, and this is uh, basically determine a how close, which is tight coupling, or you know also determine a loose coupling uh, for the, the differential pair. The larger the coupling is the lower the differential, differential impedance is. By looking at the plot shown here, 
by changing uh, the pitch size between these two vias, we can easily see that the impedance get lower and lower uh, by the smaller pitch uh, between these two vias. So we, we can think about the other, uh, the other important aspects when we are designing the differential via, uh, which is the crosstalk. Uh, since this, this two, test case is well designed, having the other really get a uh, shielding uh, between these two pair by having the other get a ground vias, uh, the coupling is substantially small. However, still, based on the other how high coupling between these two rod is, uh, we can see that uh, the next data, fax data, are different. So tight coupling basically use the less area because uh, these two via barrels are close uh, from each other, but with a, uh, a little higher loss. So we do expect that uh, with the tight coupling, the loss will be a little bit larger, but it may not be that significant because the VSI size is anyway small. High coupling is better for crosstalk performance. As we see, the red data is basically uh, <clears throat> loose coupling. The blue data is a tight coupling. So it shows you the pre, pre uh, much in a 5 dB a better performance uh, from the other crosstalk a uh, standpoint. And the other important thing of, of tight coupling is less sensitive uh, to common signal noise, which is shown pretty well uh, from the uh, picture in this slide. It's, it's a little bit hard to see that because the picture is small, but with the 75 mil, you're going to see the, a lot more electric field and magnetic field spread over uh, to the side of the uh, vias. So that means it produces a little bit more a common noise, or if there is any noise coming in, then will be will be a little bit more a sensitive a than tight coupling. So as a summary, it is always preferable to design VIAs as coaxial transmission lines, which means we try to control the VI impedance uh, to maintain a good impedance match. VSDUF acts as a series LC resonator, adding a significant loss to the channels uh, that can be also minimized by back drilling the stuff. Differential VIAs are used for differential signaling with a tight coupling more favored. Throughout this presentation, I did a lot of analysis and the tools I used or tools can be used for modeling vias. That definitely ADS will be the one. And in ADS, there are multiple engines, a transient convolution, and as parameter, a circuit simulators, along with the uh, EM engines, FEM and Momentum, uh, which is the uh, 3D planar EM simulator. And also, uh, the new tool, which is coming in the summer, the uh, designer that really calculate the older via, via impedance as a new utility uh, within ADS environment. These were the ones that I used, and also uh, EM Pro, which is the other complete a 3D EM modeling uh, environment that contains the FEM uh, as far as the FDTD uh, time domain a simulation engine. So if you are interested in the more information, uh, there is a lot of the uh, resources. Uh, so please have a chance to uh, come to this web link and uh, learn more on the uh, VIAs as well as SI and PI related high-speed uh, designs. Thank you. Okay. Before we begin the question and answer session, we would like you to help us improve our webcast and answer a couple short questions about what you saw today. In the slide window, please select the answers you feel best. First, can you please rate it your overall satisfaction with this webcast? Next, based on what you heard today, 
Would Keysight's advanced design systems have value in your work? And finally, if you do have an interest, what would your time frame be? And with that, we'll dive into our questions. Don't forget you can uh, submit questions at this point. Just put them into the question window and then hit the Submit button. So to start with, what is your opinion on maintaining a Lambda slash 8 as the via to via spacing? The smaller spacing is better, but adds costs. Any rule of thumb that you can share? Uh, I'm sorry, Bill. Uh, can you repeat the question? I, um, I missed that. I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. What is your opinion on maintaining a Lambda slash 8 as the via to via spacing? The small spacing or smaller spacing is better, but it costs more. Any rule of thumb on, that you could share? I, I think. Uh, from the, my, my uh, viewpoint or my opinion, it, it really depends. Uh, cost is one of the factor, but uh, as we talked about, the cost of a performance is another factor, and also the uh, maintaining the uh, get uh, impedance throughout the uh, multiple. So it's just grew up them, uh, but my preference is actually doing the uh, a little bit more in analysis uh, and then find the uh, best or optimum a solution instead of using the other's lambda divide by a rule. Okay. Um, there was, on slide 26, there's just a question about what the uh, NEXT and the FEXT values uh, are for. 26. 26. The value of? Uh, what is NEXT and FEXT? Oh, for this data, uh, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't apply or look at, looked at that data, so I can't tell what is exactly a next and facts for this design. But 26, slide number 26 is a transmission line routing with BIA, which is a single-ended. Uh, so I'm not quite sure uh, whether, whether you know, we can talk about the NNX or effects. Okay. Uh, next question is, why does tight coupling result in higher loss? Uh, there are multiple reasons. Uh, in, a, in, order to, in order to control the impedance, uh, Tight coupling means uh, you, you got to make the uh, impedance a little bit higher because by the tight coupling, it will lower the uh, total impedance anyway. So that means uh, you can use the uh, a little bit smaller a cross section uh, for the design. That means uh, from the loss standpoint, uh, you're gonna ha you're gonna have a higher resistance. That's what the uh, the meaning of the uh, higher loss. But it's not a lot. But when you are using this uh, tight coupling for a long transmission lines, the answer is, yeah, you're going to see the, the, the little bit bigger a loss. But since the older vias are tiny and small, the loss is not a main concern. The main concern is more of the reflection loss, not a uh, insertion loss. Due to the, those impedance mismatches, you are pushing or rejecting the, a lot of en uh, the, much of energy Therefore, the loss is not a main concern, but more like uh, maintaining the impedance uh, will be the biggest, biggest the, uh, the the design goal. Okay. Next question is: Will ground via pads and signal via pads have the same thickness typically? Ground via pads and signal via pads. Uh, I, I I'm not sure uh, whether. I can I can I can you know explain it that well, but ground vias is just ground vias uh, connecting to the older ground metals. So I'm not sure whether uh, we specifically design for pads or ground vias. Uh, I, I I don't think that's the case, but you know, uh, for signal vias compared to the other ground vias, pad size 
Yeah, once again, I'm not I'm not sure whether that really makes sense. Having the other different size for for the, the pads, especially for the other ground bees. All right. Um, is the stub resonance equation for single ended single ended or differential signals? The one that I used uh, is a, was a single ended. Uh, to explain the, the the meaning of the stuff and how they works and, and so on and so on. Yeah, that's definitely that's the the one I came from the other single ended. Okay. Most low cost, high volume PCBs don't use filled vias. A plated via with a non connectivity epoxy is common. Any comments mm -hmm. on the drawback of using uh, the filled epoxy? I, I, it depends on the uh, the skin depth. Uh, as we can imagine, uh, when we are moving up to the higher data rate, uh, which contains the higher A frequency contents, uh, the typical you know physics says a uh, the current or energy will be uh, flowing through the surface of the metal legation, which is really small. As long as we maintain uh, <clears throat> the plated through hole uh, close to the edit at the skin depth, but generally speaking, it's, it's a lot thicker. Uh, we're not going to see the other much of problems with the other plated a through hole. Although it is filled with the other the electrics, but from the wave standpoint, it's not going to see that the, uh, the electrics is because most of the energy will be confined within the skin depth uh, of the other that plated uh, through a hole. Okay. What is the most preferred way to build the VIA model? Uh, are you doing it in the layout using momentum? If so, are you building the VIA from zero? And do you have any preferred method to optimize the best via for the stack up with the minimum number of iterations? Yeah, I think that's that's really a uh, really good question. I think, you know, this will be a type of question every single uh, engineer will be faced with. Uh, I have gone through the same, same a question. Uh, the way I, I prefer, uh, this is my preference. People might use it a different way. Since... The VIA impedance will be depending on a ground return. Ground return will be determined by the structure of anti-pads and number of ground vias. Any of the other tools out there have its own you know, approximation or assumption, but I, I don't 100% trust, trust the other those uh, calculations because it assumes the other ground return, uh, you know, uh, kind of idea, which is not telling me rear impedance of the VIA. So in order to do that, uh, use to, to, in order to accurately uh, predict uh, the VIA impedance, we don't need to do, you know, this exercise for all different types of VIAs, but, you know, uh, for those VIAs which carry the, the most important uh, uh, data or signals. So it's not going to be uh, really a lot of work, but Certainly focus on the, those important VIA structures uh, in order to understand the, the VIA impedance really well and controlling the impedance, i rather use the, the 3D tools. 3D tools uh, means a, doing the, the full wave EM, EM analysis, such as FEM or FDTD or MOM. Type of en engines will be the best fit to understand the VIA impedance. But will be a little bit time consuming uh, process. Therefore, one of the suggestions uh, or that the way I do is uh, building up a one a parametric a structure that changes anti pads number of vias as well as uh, via pads and via barrel and sweep the simulation and generate the other multiple a database. Therefore, uh, this is a one-time job. Once it is done, then I can actually go and then use this a uh, polynomial-based models or as a database. I can easily pick up the other best via out of the other that a uh, swept uh, results instead of uh, just doing the simulation one by one. 
just build a database with the stack up and then uh, pick up the uh, right number, or even we can go for a tuning or optimization because the data is already uh, generated based on the other very accurate uh, EM, EM uh, simulation, and then use the, other, the database to find the best a optimized APS structure. That would be a, a my preference and recommendation. All right. How do the characteristics vary when the plating thickness of the via changes? Uh, once, once again, uh, this is a similar questions related to the plated uh, hole filled with the dielectrics. The important thing is the skin depth. Now, skin depth is determined by the, the, what the frequencies we're, we are working with. If we are just talking about the one gig uh, or you know few hundred a megahertz, we don't even a consider the skin depth. But as the frequencies goes up or data rates you know goes up higher and higher, then uh, we start to think about the other those skin depths. So. But most of cases, what we are dealing with, like a 10 gigabit per second or 15 or 20, 16, uh, these are not a frequencies really having tr much trouble with your skin depth. Uh, but yeah, definitely uh, moving up to the a lot high, more higher data rate, we just need to uh, you know start to think about it. But by ma maintaining uh, the good a depth for the planning, uh, especially having the better a uh, uh, metal radiation like uh, conductivity. Uh, some a higher a quality designs are using the other gold plating, is because how much of gold are we going to plate? Uh, it's based on the skin depth. So this is something uh, we need to manage as a designer but not only uh, managing the performance, but we also need to manage the, uh, the cost of the designs. This is where uh, we probably need to use the, uh, those, a, uh, the tools uh, and do the, the more a, uh, a vigorous analysis by changing the, the thickness of the plating and see what is the performance change to the uh, design, but uh, that's something yeah, uh, designers need to uh, manage and control. Okay. Since ADS doesn't do full 3D modeling regarding the metal layer thickness, uh, how accurate are the simulations? Uh, I have done the, a lot of the uh, testing. And also, since uh, you know, Keysight is the measurement company, we have all the facilities uh, where we can measure. Uh, and then my background is EM. Uh, so just to be frank, uh, the tool use its own approximation. Although, uh, you know, we are solving the other problems with the Maxwell equation, which is the, the most accurate the, uh, the equations and formula. But what about the other the electric constant? What about the other loss tangent? What about the other thickness? What about what about the the glass weave? There are just so much variations and tolerances, uh, although it just produced a really accurate result, but it cannot be a just top of each other. It's just extremely hard. But those EM tools are the most accurate EM, uh, the, the, the simulators, uh, compared to the, uh, any other. So FEM engine uh, inside of ADS, FEM is a finite element method, and MOM, momentum, these are very accurate. Uh, we have done the, a bunch of the uh, testings and validations. It really shows the, a really good match up to probably, I say, 50 gigahertz. The question is how accurate uh, all the parameters you are giving to the tool, the electric constant, as well as a, you know, all the material properties, including the, the accurate dimension of your design. These are a important factors. As long as these values are really correct, 
then I, I can tell uh, we can get the other probably 90 to 95 percent a accurate a simulation simulation result compared to the emitter data. So in terms okay, of 3D for tools, those that are interested, yeah, uh, 3D tools, yeah, ADS has the other 3D tools, uh, FEM inside of ADS as well as the other MOM momentum. That is a full ABA 3D EM servers. Thank you. Okay, for those that uh, would like a copy of the slides, just click on the green folder icon at the bottom of the screen. And that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank Keysight Technologies for sponsoring today's event, and of course to all of you for joining us. Have a great day.